Welcome everyone and good afternoon to you all. Welcome to another Griffith Alumni Professional Development webinar for 2023. I'm really excited about today's topic around NADOC 2023 Griffith Alumni Perspectives. This is a powerful topic and one we are very proud to be presenting. The month of July is NADOC month with the 2023 National NADOC Week theme for our elders, which we will begin discussion around shortly. Before we start, I acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from my traditional lands, the Gold Coast, and I'm sitting at the Gold Coast Griffith University campus of the Kumbamere people. And I invite you all to write in the question and answer the land or the language or community from which you are joining us today. While you're taking a moment to do this, I'm going to ask Uncle John Graham to unmute his microphone. And when he is ready, I invite Uncle John to provide us with a welcome to country. John, you'll get the live box and you're ready to go. Bagel young guy, Jim belongs. G'day friends, my name's John Graham. Proud Coomba Mary man, saltwater man, the Gold Coast region. Our people are part of the wider Yugambeh language group whose land stretched from the Logan River in the north to the Tweed River in the south, to the other side of the Great Dividing Range, out past Bow Desert, up to a place called Teviot Brook in the north and bordered by the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Coomba Mary land stretched from the Gumaru Gumaru, the Kuma River in the north, down to the uh, Tweed and to the foothills of the mountains. As it all welcomes, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, because it was old people that fought the good fight in dark and desperate times in order for people of our generation to work with other Australians towards a reconciled nation in order for us to leave a legacy for our young people. For they're the bearers of the flame, to keep us the knowledge and keep our culture strong into the future. Pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across this nation and pay my respects to the spirit of this land and her people, which includes all of us here today. My authority to speak comes through Waru, my apical ancestor, who grew up on the banks of the Logan and Narang River, Nuttingwall, place of the shovel nose Ray. In her later life, she came and lived with her daughter Jenny and husband Andrew, who were the river masters, the river pilots of the mighty Narang River, long before all the canal estates were developed, long before all the skyscrapers were built. A people who lived on a small island called Gardner Island, Graham Island, just off Brighton Parade at Southport, down from the Southport Bridge. The people were sustained by the abundance of seafood from both the river and the ocean. Our footprint remained strong in this built environment because their sovereignty was never ceded. We are and always will be the traditional custodians of this place. I say custodians, others say owners, and that's their prerogative. But I believe that Mother Earth has sustained us for eons of time, and we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have always given back. It's a message I give to small groups, it's a message I give to large groups. It's a message about sustainability, it's a message about economic sustainability, but more importantly, environmental sustainability. It's a message about looking after country, and country in our terms and language is jargon. Uh, we, we, we care for country, uh, we share country, we don't own it. Um, we come from the land, we go back to the land. It's an important message that I pass on to everyone and everyone's influences in their own spheres, so, so keep that message going. I've had the pleasure of welcoming you here today to the webinar. Uh, enjoy yourselves. I ask you several things. Respect this place, respect the fauna and flora, respect each other, and most importantly, respect yourselves. Now, I'll say on your boo, which means see you, see you soon, but I will see you very shortly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Uncle John. That was just wonderful. And I would also like to acknowledge that we have many people on very different lands today as they've popped into the question and answer chat. And so you'll be able to read that from each other where you're actually visiting from. John raises some really interesting points that I've actually written down just in his Welcome to Country. Things that we may unpack a bit later. Fight the good fight, towards a reconciled nation, spirit of the land, understanding saltwater people or perhaps freshwater people. We are and always will be. That's an interesting slogan in itself. And the sustainability of both eco environment and economic. So really great conversation points that we will begin on really shortly. Um, you know, across 
every nation, our elders have played and continue to play an important role and hold a prominent place in communities and families. This week's NAIDOC theme is for our elders, and that's what we're here to discuss. Elders are cultural knowledge holders, trailblazers, nurturers, advocates, teachers, survivors, leaders, hard workers, and of course, our loved ones. And we talk about that in every community as well. Elders guide not only through generations of advocacy and activism, but in everyday life, and also help us to understand how to place ourselves in the world. We draw strength from their knowledge and experience in everything from land management, cultural knowledge, to justice and human rights across multiple sectors like health, education, the arts, politics, and absolutely everything in between. Our elders have set the course which we follow and we advance. The struggle of our elders and our communities help us to move forward today as their tenacity and strength has carried the survival of our people. Fought the good fight, as John said. The struggles of our elders in our communities help us to move forward today. So therefore we pay our respects to the elders who are now past. We take a moment to think about who they are and to those who are present. And we continue to work for indigenous communities across all our nations. We pay homage to them and we recognize that they pave the way for future elders. Tingri Nanyanari, my name is Candice. I'm Dr. Candice Kruger. You can bear elder and some woman and lecturer in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University. My family are the Kumbamere people of the Gold Coast in the Yugambeh language region, and also Nugi of Morton Island, Morgumpin, are part of the Kwandamuk people. Like most of you, I'm a proud Griffiths alumni. I returned to studying in 2016 and, and in 2017 completed a Master of Arts research, and then in 2022 completed a Doctor of Philosophy in Aboriginal Ethnomusicology. In just a few moments, I will introduce our guest speakers to you. In addition to these online webinars, many of you know that we host a variety of networking and professional development events throughout the year. A great way to stay across these opportunities is our LinkedIn showcase page. And if you aren't following this, feel free to jump on now. There is a link in the chat function. Uh, if you are also new to Teams Live, there are a few things to help you make the most of this session. You can ask questions in the Q&A panel on your screen that's at the top. Please ask questions throughout the presentation and we'll share them, but we'll answer them at the end. If you would like to re remain anonymous when asking your question, please tick the anonymous box before posting. I would also like to let you know that this session is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. We'll email you in a few weeks when that, that is available and ready. It's best if you subscribe to the channel to be notified immediately. And you can also see the other webinars on offer, particularly those that we recorded last year or earlier this year. To begin our conversation today, you've already met him, but I am delighted to introduce you to our first guest speaker, Uncle John Graham. Uncle John is a traditional custodian of the Gold Coast, a Kumamere man, as you've heard, a saltwater man of the Gold Coast, part of the wider Yugambeh language group. He is, also has cultural ties with the Minyangbul and Waka Waka people. He is a Grim Griffith alumni, completing a business degree, majored in community cultural development, as John says back in the day. As a strong Aboriginal leader, John has instilled his stewardship, expertise, cultural knowledge and protocol in countless organisations, communities and individuals for individuals. John has supported colleagues, researchers, he supported me as well and helped me with the things that I needed to know as well, students and community members to achieve their fullest potential. John worked at Griffith University for over 20 years and is known to many, initially for five years at the College of Art in the Bachelor of Contemporary Australian Indigenous Art, and as the Senior Learning Assistance Advisor with the Gamari Unit for 16 years. And if you didn't know, Gamari is Griffith University, Murrays and Islanders. He is a current member of the Griffith University Elders and First Peoples Knowledge Holders Advisory Board. He was appointed as the Bond Elder in January 2022 under the direction of the PVC Indigenous, Keith Dunstan, and works across the university in a diversity of strategic roles. And he does the same at Griffith University. We're very proud of John and the work that he does on the Gold Coast. As a representative of the GC28 Commonwealth Games Yugambeh Elders Group, John travelled to Auckland to receive the Queen's Baton from the Maori people. The baton was brought back to Queensland to commence the Australian leg of the Queen's Baton Relay. He also received the baton from the Maori at Broadbeach on its return journey back to the 2022 Birmingham Commonwealth Games. 
As chair of the Yugambeh Regional Aboriginal Corporation Alliance, Wairaka Board, John strongly con contributes towards the ongoing development of the organisation. He is a strong advocate for this traditional custodian membership-based Aboriginal corporation in our region. So I'm now going to ask Uncle John to unmute his microphone and I'm going to hand back to Uncle John Graham as he's going to talk to us about some of the really key questions from today, what we'd like to let you know, what it means to be an elder, what is an elder, how can you support and learn from community, and I throw it open to John now. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, Candice. Um, really uh, nice uh, summing up of, of things. So, uh, and it's real important that we talk about uh, for our elders uh, during this getting towards the end of July, but um, it goes on uh, throughout our lives. I say um, before I go into it a bit more is um, we shouldn't just celebrate um, Sorry Day, Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC Week and forget about looking at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's contributions to this nation uh, as the first peoples of this of of countless years of um, knowledges, ways of being, ways of doing, ways of knowing um, as just in those certain times. I'm always thinking of our ancestors, my ancestors, uh, people that forged the way for us, um, paved the way for us and we in this situation now as we find ourselves if we go into eldership uh, we're part of that whole journey. It's a, an old saying of mine when I was at Griffith um, working with students, uh, it's, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey and the journey continues. So it's always on that lifelong um, education journey, but also learning about how to live properly. Before I go right into the things, I'm going to uh, borrow some uh, quotes from a from an article my auntie Mary wrote um, and she's given me permission to talk about it, but it talks about Aboriginal culture itself is highly ethical insofar as it reflects on an ethic of looking after, of stewardship, firstly towards the land and then throughout society, giving rise to unique civilization culture, which has its own logic, philosophy, values and notions of social development. The summarized view of Aboriginal ethics encompasses not only appropriate social conduct, social and political structure of society, all knowledge, sacred and otherwise, spiritual obligations, but also includes systems of logic, time and space. These are some of the um, characteristics uh, in this collective of terms of reference that Mary's put together. The obligation and custodial ethic, looking after country, which I mentioned in my welcome, looking after kin, primacy of family, especially children and young people, encouraging the maintenance of harmonious relations and positive conflict management with autonomous regard, careful management of ego to encourage non-egotism, no big noting, <laughs> I like that one, um, knowledge, knowledgeable people, including elders, representing the authority of the collective and power is diffused among the people. That is, people and power and authority are not conflated together as in many other cultures. Maintaining organizational principles such as non-hierarchical structures with men and women in balance, which is a really important one. Being supportive of and upholding positive group dynamics and attending consensus decision making. Viewing and encouraging cultural knowledge and principles such as land as a moral entity and foundation of Aboriginal, and, uh, Aboriginal spiritual integrity. Accepting the primacy of place, identity and autonomy as an organising principle. Aboriginal society is a civilizational culture, not civilizational state. That is a social and political ordered system with self-regulated ecological, sacralized stewardships and laws of obligation. So with that, um, I just wanted to leave those with you because she's a wonderful person and one of the people that have been very influential in my life from the Graham line, uh, including my mum and dad who passed, but Mary still uh, provides that high level uh, philosophical ways of looking at things from an indigenous uh, perspective. Uh, and then many other people that I know, such as Uncle Bob Anderson, Candace's dad, other people in the community, Uncle Graham Dillon that's passed, um, 
you know, these are the, the pillars of people that um, we stand behind. We were on the backs of all these um, giants before us and some are still alive, which is great. But we just need to, in this uh, week, I've reflected on many of the people and I, I only mentioned a couple of the people that have been big influences in my own life. Um, and the roles, the special roles that elders still play in all communities right across Australia. I mean, I can talk with authority and, and knowledge about my own direct community with the Gold Coast, not so much Waka Waka and Mingamool, but um, I do know um, my mother's side, the Mingamool people um, around Mount Wollumbin, Mount Warning, um, and the stories of um, struggles and ways that they ended up on the coast here. So that's important. Um, so I look at um, the roles that elders do, is, and I mentioned some of them in the characteristics before, but advocacy, um, cultural support uh, for many, many people, including everyone throughout the community, uh, ways of being, knowing and doing. They're the sort of things that still uh, imbue people to become into the role of an elder. Um, You've got to earn your eldership through years of constant support and and sharing um, of your ideas and sharing of of people's um, and caring for country and caring for community. They're the important things for me. There's other things as well that you know we be, you become sort of person that may um, be able to help a lot of uh, solve a lot of problems, but also. Um, are there as guidance for for many people and and I had that experience when I was at the university um, as an employee. Uh, I really loved my time at the university and all the other jobs that I've had. I worked at Aboriginal hostels for almost 10 years um, and that was a big learning curve for me meeting many, many elders right across the country, um, not just Queensland um, elders and and other people that have since become on come elders. They're um, had the pleasure of meeting uh, Uncle Charlie Perkins when he was still alive and uh, having a great yarn with him. He was a very wise, wise man. And um, I take my hat off to what he achieved uh, through the Freedom Ride and, and you know, everything that's forged the way forward for us through to reconciliation now, um, even as we go towards the referendum. It's just remembering all those people that have um, done a lot of hard work and, and with others to make a better place for us. Um, I knew I know when I was growing up, it was a different place to, to live, um, but now things have changed um, as much as I can see uh, since the rec reconciliation movement has got underway and there's many people in the community that support reconciliation between everyone. Um, and one of my favourite things of saying is um, we go to together as one to form a, a culture, but we have different cultures but we all have to recognise and respect each other's cultures and, and celebrate. I think that's the big thing that sometimes gets um, forgotten, that we don't celebrate enough as, as Australians. We do with sporting events and, and such and the like, but we need to celebrate all the small things that happen in the community um, right across Australia. Um, what else? So as I said, I've, I've remembered many of the, the people that fought the good fight um, and they were trying and and tiring times. People uh, worked themselves um, in the old days of of doing stuff for others, um, and it's it's about that caring, and it's also about um, looking after our country as 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 such. Um, yeah, I think that's um, getting close to what I need to say um, for for this section. But I'm happy to. Um, answer questions when we come to that situation. So uh, at this stage, Candice, I don't have much more to say on, on the stuff. I, I mean, I really celebrate NAIDOC week, always do, but um, as I said, my message is to not just put it to the side once it finishes, um, continue that thought. And the big thing for me is having the yarn with people um, and making sure it's a respectful conversation. We, we will have differing views on things, but it's, it's always important that we um, are more um, highly um, you know, intelligent ways of doing stuff. So yeah, okay. Thank you, Candice. Thanks, John. Oh, and it's back to me. 
Thanks, Uncle John. That was just fantastic. There's just so much that we can actually take away um, from what you've just spoken about. You know, I really understand um, the the term of obligation. I think you you may have just said doing stuff for others, but we can say doing stuff for others, but we could actually really let our audience understand that it's a cultural obligation. Um, more recently, so so for the audience to to understand when we've been talking about elders past present and sometimes you hear past present and emerging emerging is not necessarily talking about our young judge and our children emerging is probably more talking about perhaps where i am so in a couple of weeks time well it's probably even shorter than that now i turn 51 and it last year in my celebration of my 50th birthday year the community said to me well you've been our song woman for a little while but you're actually our elder as well um and so i came to this this point where i have a grandchild of my own uh that i that i'm community are calling me auntie and and the kids are calling me auntie and then i have elder status and then i'm song woman and then i'm it's now my turn and my responsibility for all of those people whose shoulders i stood on you know john said the pillars that we stand behind for me uncle graham dylan aunty rose dylan aunty patricia o'connor aunty yasola best uncle bob anderson uncle ivan not um uncle john himself my grandfather sam lavinge and my father ian lavinge these are incredible pillars and shoulders of people that are their shoulders that i have stood on in community and as i have gathered retained researched, furthered our knowledges and gifted my time to um, creating and imagining what singing language alive sounds like. And many of you would know that I have the Yugan Bear Youth Choir and I've volunteered my time now for over 10 years for that community. It is my cultural obligation to do that. It's the integrity of and the spirituality of what I know is behind my community and what they have done for us. You know, careful of not um, having ego and big noting. It's really hard sometimes, John, when you go, you know how the Wallabies did the national anthem in Yugambe language? Well, that's my work and the work of the Yugambe Youth Choir. It's not that it's big noting and being careful of our ego, but we really want Australians to understand and to know the work that we're doing in reconciliation, in language revitalization, and understanding that uh it might it's not a wokeism to go and do this as was reported on the the bolt report on the work that i did it actually this work was done 12 13 years ago um on early language work that my grandfather and uh, sam lavinge and his two cousins patricia o'connor and yusola best had actually put together and it was in 2011 that the national anthem was actually formally handed to queensland parliament so this is a journey of a lifelong or more than 10 years worth of work that our community and people have been doing and it, the people and community have been putting this together and I think that John raises so many really incredible points about social development, um, social conduct, uh, looking after country and looking after kin and that's what we do as community. We come together so when we say that we always are and always will be it is that idea of community and putting pulling community together and then working forward with each other you know so often um, in the school of education so the one thing that's being asked of pre-service teachers and then teachers once they're out in the workforce is i need to embed indigenous knowledges into the curriculum and into my classroom teaching how can i do this most of the time I've heard people say, well, I might just go and ask an elder rather than going to ask an elder and consider when we're asked to do a reconciliation action plan in your workplace as well. Rather than just going and finding an elder, why don't you consider getting to know the community? Why don't you consider getting to know the people and the organisations that are around and beside you? It's that idea of if we think we've all been to school, so we understand a school gate is not leaving culture and identity at the school gate. It's inviting it in to the workplace, into the school environment. And so when we consider for our elders, we consider communities worth of knowledge. We consider understanding. We consider knowing about social constructs of a community that, that have been here for a really long time. So how do we invite that into the place and into our workplace? Well, these are questions that we try to unpack and try to get to know.
So I hope that you've enjoyed hearing from Uncle John and I know that there will be some questions that we'll ask from him in a minute. I'm now delighted to introduce our second speaker. This is Eric Kruger. He's a Griffith Business School graduate and is a current Master of Secondary Teaching in the School of Education and Professional Studies student. Eric is a young man who is working in community and working alongside his community as he develops his own identity and, and learns more about cultural knowledge and cultural understanding. And I throw to Eric in just a moment. Eric, um, invite you to unmute your microphone now as we get ready to come live to you. And Eric, feel free to reflect on what I have said, what Uncle John has said, and perhaps also to give us your thoughts on For Our Elders. Uh, jingery jingery. Hi everybody. Um, well, I mean, I've been introduced, so I guess I don't really need to introduce myself. Um, so I think a lot of what I've wanted to say has really already been said, um, just in terms of elders have been fighting the good fight their whole lives and as have the elders who have come before them and those who are coming now. Um, so elders are essentially the cornerstones of our community. They are the holders of knowledge and customs and they sort of guide us as we move through the cultural space. Um, yeah, so in terms of respecting our elders, it's sort of really important to, um, or it's, it's really important to sort of respect our elders as they are, as they play this important role within our community. Um, and as uh, John has sort of said, this occurs all the time, every day of the week, not just on our important days of the year, but this work is happening sort of all the time. Um, yeah. Thanks. Not sure what else. That's all right. I'll ask you some questions. Oh, just wait till it comes back to me. Am I live to me? Oh, I'm live. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, you know, you make some really interesting points there. Um, and I just would also like the audience to know, Eric is actually my son. He's a Kumbamiri Nugi fella. Um, the reason that I actually asked Eric to come on board today and have a chat to us is Eric has actually worked with Uncle John on um, giving welcome to countries. Eric sings many of our songs alive in community and was the first to sing the call, um, Call to Crowbury. Call to Crowbury is a song that is over 100 40 years old that we know of and it was the male voice that would sing over um, Yugam Bear country so it was recalled and heard by a non-indigenous family that actually passed it down their family line and then finally went back to the Yugam Bear Museum, which is in Bean Lee, and was able to hand this song over and say, we'd really like to give back to a community a song. We're not sure if you know this song. And we didn't. We didn't have knowledge of the song because the Bo the three Bora grounds of our three brothers dreaming stories that was held that, that is in um, the Tambourine Village area where this song was held over. Eric was actually able to take the opportunity to sing that song back to community and to sing it alive. I might actually ask Eric very soon if he if he feels like singing it just to let you know that it's a call to gather you come you come you all come here sorry to put you on the spot Eric he's probably a bit used to me doing that um but you know Eric is someone who is working towards understanding community working with Eric works alongside me and assists me with the Yugam Bear Youth Choir and there'll be a point where Eric is no longer youth five to twenty five and then Eric's responsibility if he chooses to take it on is that obligation to looking after country, to looking after kin, to knowing language, to understanding what that actually means. There's such a strong connection for us when we actually connect to language. So John said to us earlier uh, in his welcome to country, uh, he said, you know, we always are and always will be. 
And I think you've probably also heard Uncle John, myself and Eric all say Nanyanari as we introduce ourselves, I am, or my name is, if you want to non-literal non translation. But in terms of an actual welcome to country, this is something that we do within communities and we have done for hundreds of years, I, I dare say thousands of years as the way that our communities have worked. But just in terms of what we do know in living cultural memory and history, as the communities came together over um, every three years, the Southeast Queensland communities, they sang a song to each other, that then a song that went away and formed part of our own little celebrations in community. And I'm pretty sure you've seen it sung, you've heard it sung, I apologise, or you've seen it danced with arms swishing to the side and going up and then showing out who our community is. But that's actually the Gurri Nyanami. Gurri, Guri, Murray. Nunga, it's all, they are words and terms for Aboriginal. And then when we add that next phrase to it, Gari Indanami, that Indanami, I am, we say, I am Aboriginal. Gari Indanami, I am Aboriginal. That's why this is a welcome to country song, not an acknowledgement of country to song. And that is the difference. A person who can say they are Aboriginal or a person that is acknowledging Aboriginal people. And I will give an acknowledgement to country when I'm on a different community in, in a different place. But I can also still sing the I am Aboriginal song. So we sing that I am Aboriginal. And then we say, Jojo Moberono, day of three, day of yesterday, day of today, day of tomorrow. Maybe it's a slogan that you've seen on a shirt, always was, always is, always will be. Or maybe it's just the way that uh, an elder or a community member has said to you, we are always here. We have always been here. We will be here tomorrow as well. That's part of understanding the language. And then Gariman Marangai. Well, I'm an old woman. Gariman is the stories and Marangai is the old women. And I tell the stories really well. I'm really actually really happy with how I tell the stories because it's important that you understand and that we all learn together. And then we sing Jagungunga Jono. Jago in our country, our country and our people, born of our mother's country, are very, very old. We've been singing this song to you for a really long time, but we actually have to understand and not just watch Aboriginal culture. We can't just look at it and go, that's lovely. We have to get involved and understand what the language means. For many of you, you speak Aboriginal language every day. It's in the street signs, the suburb names, um, even if you're talking about a different place around Australia, you might say you're watching the NRL and you go, oh, go Parramatta, the eels. Parramatta means eel in language there. If you are here on the Gold Coast and you say, I'm going for a swim at Karawa, you're going for a swim at the place of the deep blue ocean. If you say, I'm going to Kira, Gira, the place of the white cockatoo, and so we need to remember that what we're actually doing is we have a place in Australia where our languages are hybrided together, where it's woven. We have circular storytelling, not um, straight line storytelling, that stories come back around, that we are weaving English and we are weaving our languages together. And it's important that we understand that that's right there in front of us. I've already had a question of where we can hear the songs that it mentioned. You can actually go to the Yugen Bay Youth Choir and just look at YouTube. You can go to our website and there are songs or links that will take you there. Um, I've also heard there's a sorry, I apologize. I have also seen that there's been a question that has come in. I think I'd like to address this right now. It's quite an important one. Um, someone has recently learned about historical atrocities across the region of the Gold Coast or across around these regions uh, or around even Australia and, and not really realised in the true path of reconciliation uh, what has perhaps happened in the past. There are different places um, on the internet that you can go and look up um, historical past hurts that have happened to Indigenous people. You might even want and choose to read about the terms of Aboriginal, Aborigine, Native, Indigenous, First Nations, and how all of these terms have come about with different policies. So it's really difficult sometimes to actually go, I didn't know that 
on Moreton Island, for example, that Aboriginal people uh, were killed and and that some Abri and the remaining Aboriginal people were moved off to South Strabrek Island. It's really OK that you didn't know, but perhaps you but now that you do know, you can't unknow. It's the same as language. Now you do know that language is right there and in front of you and that you're talking about and speaking language every day, including the words koala and kangaroo being Aboriginal words. Now that you know, you can't unknow. So you should go and learn some more. And this is what being an elder is about. The responsibility and the obligation to teach, to nurture, to move forward a reconciled nation and to recognise how we can help and sustain both our ecological state of our nation and also our economic state of our nation. So um, it's probably time that we have just those little bit of question and answer. So I'm just going to wait for um, our facilitators to pop some questions in the question and answer. Uncle John, I can't actually see your face, so I'm wondering if you're still there. And I'm going to throw over to you just for a minute, John, to just see if you would like to make any comments about what Arik and I have said. If you turn your mic on. Wonderful, and you're live. Yeah, thanks, Candice. Um, no, there's some really good stuff. And that uh, I want to make a point. It's a bit political, but I'm going to say it. Um, Bolt usually looks for the negatives and doesn't like uh, any sort of celebration, especially when it comes to celebrating first people stuff that happens around the nation. Um, extreme right wing uh, perspective on on everything. So thanks for bringing that up about um, if he if he give you any grief about it. And I didn't read the article, but um once again uh, a negative view where you know we i talked about relationship briefly but i think developing relationships between everyone um needs to be paramount uh, as well as looking after the environment but in other stuff but i would um encourage people to get to know aboriginal people where they live or where they whether whether at your university come into the centres and uh, ask um, people about if they can in, in, engage in conversation and have a bit of a yarn about things. Come to any of um, the celebrations that are on um, throughout the year. Um, so it's important that we do that because I remember growing up, it wasn't always the case um, on the Australian landscape that um, we were accepted into many, uh, many places. Uh, you had to be either a good sportsman or a sportsman myself, but uh without the sport i saw many other people um that were uh, treated really badly um and that always remains with me of how people could um make assumptions uh when they weren't very well developed it goes back to what you said with um learning more uh knowing about things now uh i always blame the education system uh, and government policies of the day that uh finds us having to come to reconciliation and and get together and i do take my hat off to everyone that's sort of on that path and and been part of that path for a long time i think it's important for us as australians to come together as i said we go together as one celebrating each other's cultures but our culture is the first people's needs to be celebrated um which it always hasn't been um you know quite derogatory stuff i'm not going to say it on the webinar but i do remember all the hurtful things that were said not just to me, but to friends of mine and um, was said to us by people that we actually went to school with and lived in the community with. So I don't cop that anymore from anyone. I'll, I'll just um, say my piece about it. I won't uh, engage in any fisticuffs or anything, but at the end of the day, um, we all need to respect each other. Um, that's probably the big thing for me today, but go ahead and try and develop a relationship with people. And, and as Candace said, make, make yourself uh, more knowledgeable about everything that she's talked about with, you know, the songs, the arts, the sport, um, but everything else, um, how we fought in the wars, uh, weren't allowed into ourselves uh, when, we, when our, our uh, relatives uh, come back from the wars, um, weren't even given a plot of land as many of the other um, diggers, diggers were and we're all, they all fought together. And, I will take my hat off to all the um the old RSL, the the, the um not the RSL, the the servicemen that serve and service women that serve together 
that camaraderie was still there after the after the war. So that's not that far away. And I mean, I think things have improved a bit with the modern conflict areas, but we were always part of it. We were there fighting for country as well. Um, so there are a couple of comments I'd just like to make. Thank you. I'll see that come back to me. And oh, and we're back to me. Thanks, John. Um, really fantastic comments. And it is really hard sometimes for us to not get political when we just really like to have conversations with people. I know that there, there may be people sitting there right now that really want to know more about how will treaty help or how will the voice help. That's not a discussion that we're going to have today. I um, understand that in the question A in your chat that you'll be given a link that takes you across to um, a Griffith site that is there to assist you with resources on both sides of the voice debate, uh, both yes and no, so that you can go and be informed. And I think that that's the most important part is it's not my place to tell you which way to vote. It's for you to be informed as to what both sides of the argument are saying and where we'd like you to go with that. Um, do you know the other questions that are coming in because I've just touched on language are things like, you know, in, in New Zealand, for example, you're actually able to learn Maori language up until high school. And so there are many um, New Zealand students that come to Australia that actually have and can speak some Maori language. We don't have that here in Australia. We are trying to, but we also need to realise, and, and there was another question as well where someone said, how can I help with more knowledge is in the healthcare system and how can I assist people? We need to recognise and understand that there's a one to two generations of Indigenous people that were not allowed to speak their language, were not taught their language and had to be quiet on the history and the culture of knowledges. So while my uh, parent who is in his mid to late 70s, um, heard some language words and and heard it spoken or well, didn't have the opportunity to learn it and if you go back to his father who would probably be about 110 years old now if he was alive um and and his my grandmother his wife is still alive and she's 101 she will even say the same we heard language of the olds being spoken around us and but there wasn't the opportunity to actually learn it. But then every now and then you hear these little stories and I heard them, for example, of my of my father's grandfather who was on South Stratbrook Island and he was part of the, the living family, um, Alberti and in the, oyster, uh, the oysters um, and the farming that we had. He would have in jars um, different sea creatures and he would go over over to the mainland, over to town and come back with some lollies for the kids, hardboard lollies or little chocolate lollies or something like that. And if they could actually name in language the animals, the sea creatures that were in the jars, he'd give them a treat. So there were all these, these other ways. And that's why song is so important to me, because it's a vehicle that we've been able to continue to learn stories and songs that's been handed down. Now I'm going to throw to Eric for just a moment. Eric, smile. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Eric to just sing for you just once through Eric, the call to Crowberry, because this is a song, like I said, that's over 140 years old, that was recalled by non-Indigenous people that in true reconciliation pulled back a song to help us. Ah, uh, yeah, sure, no worries. Why, 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 I'm really thanking the facilitators for flicking around and changing our cameras to each of us. Eric, that was just wonderful. In that very small space, we learnt so much about Aboriginal culture and language and song. And what you, you may not understand is that we've heard um, the, the nuances of language. We've heard the bird calls in country. We have understood that this is a gathering that we can all come together. And these are ways that we can better care for our environment 
and our sustainability of there are certain bird calls that we continue to sing. Am I still hearing those birds now? Is, is there a reason in the season why I haven't been hearing kookaburras? Um, when we when we look out at the animals or the fish sources, so for example, the mullet run is happening now, and you've probably all seen the little hairy grubs that cross in the line going across um, your footpaths or your roads. When you see that, you actually know that we're getting ready for mullet season. And um, we're also seeing the, the blossoms of the trees. So we're looking at our environment. If our environment's not healthy, we also can't then see the signs of what's coming. I know I saw it on the news this morning that there was a very large pod of um, whales that have beached on Western Australia and, and a entire community got out and pushed some whales back into the ocean, but then they beached themselves again. We have to wonder what's happening in our environment that that might be the case. Why are they off course? And so we have to ask ourselves these questions about what's going on. Now, I've had um, a really interesting question come in where someone has said that there is internalized racism and 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 it might be um, different communities or ages of people and it's really difficult for our younger generation to be exposed to it what i suggest is is that you open conversation we open conversation to living memory let's take for example um i have been asked and and i'm just going to open right up here and say it. i've been asked many times how much aboriginal are you now, I could answer you and say, well, I pass a legal definition of Aboriginality if you want to go and take my blood. You can see my strong cheekbones, my small back of head, my broad barreled chest, so many features, but my skin is not as dark as some people would like it to be. Therefore, that's really hard sometimes for me to say I'm Aboriginal, but I always identify and I always also say that I'm really, really proud of my European heritage. My mum is so proud of the Aboriginal culture and raising Aboriginal children and Aboriginal grandchildren. I lived in Sherberg for some time when I was a younger child and I completely understand the nuances of different communities and where we are. So if we have people in living memory, they can still ask me today, how much Aboriginal are you? But that hasn't been the legal definition for a very long time. We're always going to have conversations that seem racist, that seem difficult to actually talk about. And so what we have to do instead is open that narrative and we have to understand what bloodline ties mean. I think John may have mentioned it earlier on and I have ties too and I've heard my father say it as well and I have ties too, but it's the bloodline, who we are in community, how we know who we are and also that we respect community that has been here and the knowledge and that we help move this forward. Um, and so there's a question of John, and it is Arnie Mary's last name, Arnie Mary Graham. I can answer that for you. And you can really easily look up Arnie Mary Graham's academic work. John, would you like to say anything else about that? I'll throw it to you. Thanks, Candice. Um, yeah, look, Arnie Mary's like a sage within our community. She's Got a lot of knowledge, uh, acquired knowledge from our own family's background, way right back to our, um, our our grandfather, her grandfather, uh, Frank Graham, and also back to Jenny Graham, uh, um, Waru's um, daughter. But she's had that knowledge that she developed it over many years of um, going back to uni um, at UQ, uh, is now one of their um, adjunct professors at UQ and also at QUT. Um, she's always been interested in um, Aboriginal uh, philosophy, but also um, Aboriginal governance, ways of doing and being. And one of the fa favourite things that she taught me several years ago now that I didn't know about, because when you look at, uh, if you ever get a chance to look at the Aboriginal map, and I always refer to the Tyndale map, but it can be the colourful Ayatsis map uh, that you'll see on Aboriginal countries. Our countries, we never invaded other people's countries over a long, long time. So, I mean, we can go back 50, 80,000 years. Um, people developed systems of governance, systems of looking after country and sharing with neighbours and that. 
but there was never any wars. There was skirmishes um, and, you know, disputes that took place, but never anyone ever conquered land. Um, that was the big thing or took land from others. Uh, and that still continues on into today's society. Um, me, Candace and others can talk with some authority um, on the Gold Coast area. But once we go past the Logan River up to Brisbane area, Yaga and Turbal people are the people there. I can't speak on um, Stradbrook Island, whereas Candace possibly can. Um, and then to the south, the Bunjalung. Um, the language is similar. Our language speakers, including Candace and, and Sean Davies, uh, it's very similar from what they've told me. But um, I don't wouldn't dare go down there and tell them. I can advise people if they ask me for my response to a question, but it's always been a diplomatic way of dealing with other communities. But that's throughout the whole of Australia. So if you look at that map, there's big communities uh, in different areas. Some are called nations, some are just language groups, some are clan groups, but the places on those maps give you an idea of we had a very um, collected, collective way of doing things. So the song lines are many of the um, lines that, um, well, the roads that are built, current roads, take a lot of, a lot, a lot of our song lines into doing, being. Um, those song lines uh, offered uh, passage into different people's country you had to be welcomed in, as Candace said before, you couldn't just rock up and, and walk into someone's country. You had to either be carrying a message stick or making sure that you let them know um, as courtesy that you're coming into their country to conduct business or you're going somewhere else through their country to see someone else in another person's country. So it's not just the, um, the old fable that uh, Cook and Banks spread to um, history writers. Um, that we were just a, a mob of meandering um, hunters and gatherers. There was a collective of people that foraged and, and went with seasonal, as Candice just mentioned, seasonal foods. And, and on the Gold Coast, we were lucky. Uh, as one of our other colleagues says, um, the Gold Coast was a big supermarket. So besides all the seafood, we also had all the other animals and birds and insects and, and um, plants and that to keep us well sustained. So. And many of our people shared that with others that may have uh, come across hard times. So it's important that that's not forgotten. So all those celebrations that we talk about, the, um, the ceremonies, uh, conducting business in the Bora Rings, um, we conducted that over a long, long time. And it was a, a thing of reciprocity um, with two-way giving. So that was uh, talked about, but, but that's a further conversation. So thanks, Ken. And it's coming back to me, I think, here. Wonderful. Thanks, John. You know, John's so right when he says that the Gold Coast was such a large supermarket. We, um, people recall Emu on the Beach, um, the prized food sources, um, you know, things like uh, fresh water across country, Mananjali people walking down, family members walking down and coming across land with a uh, kangaroo and prized echidna or um, Borobi, uh, koala, and then exchanging and taking fresh seafood home or at least for the first day and part of, of the walk. And I know I watch it now where um, older people still care for our older people in community or the young people turn up to someone's house with, here's some fish uncle or here's some fish auntie that's just come out of the sea as we care and help each other move forward. Um, you know, I, there are range, Indigenous Rangers programs in place here on the Gold Coast and in other places right across Australia now so that we are beginning to look at these Indigenous land management being at the forefront of our sustainable practices and looking at and understanding fire management and regeneration that was actually practised some a long time ago and is being repractised again today. As I begin to wrap this up, I encourage you all to do a deep dive on the internet. We've had questions about how can I find different languages up further up north in the Torres Strait? How can I understand and relate this to health or to education? Again, because communities lost some connection, we may be a little bit further behind pulling those knowledges back together or communities might be holding on to these knowledges for themselves just a little bit before they're ready to share them with the wider community. So I encourage you for that deep dive on the internet to look for videos, maps, 
language dictionaries, maybe go and look at native title in your region and where that is up to the, for the community so that you can begin to actually understand and what community organisations exist in your local area to help you out as well. Look, I really recognise that we weren't able to answer all questions today, so we'll certainly look to respond to any in our post um, event email. A, a reminder that this webinar was recorded and we will email you out the link to this recording in a few weeks time so you can watch again, share with your friends and catch anything that you missed. We will send a follow up email in a few days asking for your feedback on this session. It's also a great opportunity to submit to submit ideas for future topics for events like these. We'll have another webinar available for you very soon, a new topic with another Griffith alumni. So please keep your eye peel, eyes peeled for an invitation coming very soon. Our most recent webinar on how to become an effective bystander with Griffith alumni, Sean Ross Smith, is already available on the YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to the channel, you'll never miss out, including letting anyone know about what we've talked about today. That's Griffith University Alumni and Giving, and there is also a link on the alumni website. I am thrilled and really proud to have shared my time today with Eric and with Uncle John. Uh, there is so much expertise that both of these men hold. One as an elder and having worked and lived and, and um, thrived on the shoulders of others. And then another young man who is coming along in that same space that we are all giving time to, to assist to become um, a future leader for our community. I'm thrilled that you listened to what I had to say today. And I thank you for those that do actually follow the work that I do with the Yugambeh Youth Choir and also in community. I really, really highly encourage you to go looking for more information to find out more. But again, thank you, Uncle John and Eric, for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And thank you to everyone for attending online. As John said, um, boo. see you next time. Or we can say bagu wanyi, thank you, or guni mananya. I'll finish with Our Tale is Told. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.